Hello Shaler area, welcome back for note video number nine. In this note video, we're gonna be talking more about the periodic table and the trends that you can find inside it. So here's your periodic table. This contains all of the elements in the universe that we know of. And there's a pretty good bet that that's pretty much all the elements in the universe that there is. Uh, we're going to talk about what the different regions are for, why it's in the order that it's in, and that's going to lead to you developing a skill set where you can find one element in the table and know how to make a molecule out of it with an element on the other side. I should say before we move on, the we're going to focus in eighth grade the this part of the table on the left and this part of the table on the right. Uh, when we actually discuss how chemistry works, that's the part we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about just these elements and these elements. When you get to the high school, you're going to learn how chemistry works with these elements and the ones at the bottom. So you're going to need to kind of know what the regions are, but you're not going to need to know how any of these elements actually work or bond together. Um, so remember, we're just doing the basics. All right, so the periodic table is laid out in rows, which go sideways, in columns, which go up and down. The rows are called periods. And if you remember from the last note video, the, the word period means repeating patterns. And that's because as you go down the rows, you experience repeating patterns across the table. The columns are called families. You can also call them groups. Both words apply to the up and down portion of the periodic table. Now here's the beginning of the patterns that you're gonna need to remember. And you've already figured this one out when we did the Happy Atoms Labs. Um, all of the elements in a family share a common reactivity. Actually, I guess what you figured out in the Happy Atoms Labs is the reason that they share a common reactivity. They share a common reactivity, remember, because they have the same number of valence electrons. So all of the elements in a column react the same way. Reactivity is the ease and speed at which the element will react. So if you would put that element in a, in a situation with some other elements, which ones is it going to react with? How fast is it going to react? Is it going to be endothermic or exothermic? All of the elements in a column or in a family all react the same way. Now, some of these elements in the table react super easy. Um, you can think of them as being made out of like Velcro or something, and all you have to do is have them touch each other as they're floating around in you know, the void. Uh, and if they touch each other, they'll just join and lock together, much like they do in your Happy Atoms Labs. Um, you know, they have those like kind of magnetic things on them and the, the modeling kits do. And if you get them close, they just kind of snap together and hey, you have a molecule. Other elements, though, take a little bit of uh, extra encouragement in order to make them form molecules. Sometimes you need to add some heat to get them to move faster and kind of vibrate and, you know, and, and hit each other with more force in order to join together. Sometimes you need pressure to really, you know, keep them close. Um, and, and really it all comes down to the fact that these, uh, these objects are three-dimensional. You know, they're not flat, but you can kind of think of them as like three-dimensional puzzle pieces because those electron orbits that go around the nucleus where, the, where you find the electrons zooming around super fast, they have different shapes. And what you are really trying to do is to get those shapes to kind of lock together and meet um, just right. And when they do, they, they join up, you form a chemical bond. Um, so for some of these that are more complicated, you can imagine that it's kind of like, have you ever played the game Perfection? where you have a certain amount of time and you have those, all those weird shapes and you gotta to try to put them in the holes and you know the, some of them are really complicated and you have a hard time getting it spun just right to get it in that hole. That's what it is to try to make some of these chemical reactions. So some of them really easy to put together, some of them a lot more difficult to get them lined up right to join. Now you have this part of the table down here called the expanded table um, and this is the region, these are called the lanthanide and the actinide series, and we'll talk more about them later. But to make sure all the patterns are staying, um, they seem like they're separate and down here, but actually all of these green elements would fit right in that spot. And all of these red elements 
would fit right in that spot if we were talking about how they would like react. So they would actually be in the same column with each other. Um, but in order for everything else to maintain the same patterns where they're in the right columns, these all need to go right there and these all need to go right there. And that has to do with something you're going to learn about at the high school. Um, the honors level videos discuss this a little bit, but those electron clouds have different shapes. And one of the shapes is called the S shape, and that's where you get all these guys. One of the shapes is called the P shape, and that's where these are all at. One of the shapes is called the D shape, and that's what you find here. And then one of the shapes is called the F shape, and this is where you find all these guys. So that's why it's kind of broken apart that way, but you'll get that in the high school. All right, so what are some different kinds of elements? Most elements are metals, and that makes them shiny. It makes them malleable. When something's malleable, it means you can hammer it into shapes. You can flatten it out, and you can fold it and things like that without breaking it. Um, it can be, it, metals are ductile. That means just like you can flatten them out and bend them, you can also draw them into long, thin wires. Uh, if you kind of pull, pull on them enough, instead of them just breaking, they stretch out and just get thinner and thinner and thinner. They're also very good conductors. And these are all because of the special bonds that exist between metals. So you've learned about covalent bonds and ionic bonds. There is a third kind of bond called a metallic bond that you don't need to know about yet. But because of the way that the electrons are shared in the, in the metallic bonds, you get all of these properties. Um, it makes it so that when... If you have like a whole mass of, of these atoms all joined together, the metallic bond properties makes those bonds very flexible. You can bend them and you can kind of like spread them, like, like move them around at will. And that's why you can change the shapes of metals very, very easily. And since electrons are the whole heart of electricity, that's what makes them also really good conductors. Those things can move all around inside that entire mass of metal and kind of go from one end to the other without being slowed down or stopped along the way. So metals. Generally, metals will react by losing electrons. Um, that's not something you have to worry about memorizing, but that's, that's typically what will happen. And what you do need to remember, though, this is one of the other important patterns in the table. So just like you remember that, you know, they go left and right, they're called periods, they go up and down, they're called families. Well, as you move left and down, so as you go, oh, that's a terrible color. Let's try that again. As you go, how about white? As you go this way down the table, you end up um, becoming more and more reactive for metals. So the metals, as you go down and to the left, get more and more and more reactive. That means that francium this one right down here is the most reactive metal in the universe right now. Other things that I think I'll touch on that later. All right, so non-metals. I guess I should point out in this periodic table where the metals are. So everything, uh, let's go all the way back to the beginning. There's a big periodic table. All right, so here is the whole periodic table. And everything down from this green line here. So all of these, everything down here at the bottom, well, most of the stuff at the bottom, and then all of this stuff here, these are your metals. All right, now they have different names. You can look, these are called alkali metals. The second column are called alkali earth metals. These are called transition metals. These are called your common or your basic metals. Um, and then those are all of your, the metals that we're talking about. And you can see most of the elements in the universe then would fall under the category of metals. But remember one thing, always keep something in mind when we're talking about groups. It's not like nature has these groups. Nature just has a bunch of these elements. We put things in groups, we categorize them in order to be able to discuss them more easily. So yeah, they all are, are similar to each other but you're gonna find a whole range of properties. And what actually ends up happening is you get your non-metals over here and you get your metals down here and there's this like gradient of change as you go from one to the other. 
So when we categorize things, though, we have to draw a line somewhere. And you know, so the line that we happen to draw was right there on the periodic table. But you're gonna see some properties from metals over here and metals over here that don't exactly match up, but they're both still metals. And sometimes you'll be like, oh, that one's kind of similar to how a non-metal behaves. Um, that's just the way that it's the nature of the beast whenever we are putting things in groups. Gotta draw a line somewhere. All right, where were we? Non-metals. So the non-metals would be the elements that, well, are metals. And there is a third group, doesn't seem you, know, you would think there would just be metals and nonmetals, but there is a third group, that, that line that was there in the middle. Um, nonmetals have properties that really, really, really vary from each other. Those metals are pretty similar. Like, they're, they're all conductive. They can all conduct electricity. They can, you know, they, they're all, for the most part, shiny. Um, they can be pretty, pretty colorful. Um, nonmetals have properties all over the place. Uh, there's not a whole lot of a pattern to them. That's why they're just a group of nonmetals. Many of them, if you came across them in their pure forms, would be poisonous to you and all other life forms. You don't find many in pure forms because you find them reacted with other things. And that's one of the reasons that they're poisonous is because they're highly reactive. Um, all life on Earth, though, is based on carbon. This is one of the things that you definitely need to know. You might want to put a star next to this one. All life is made from carbon. On Earth, we are carbon-based life forms. That's why when people discuss you know, finding life in other places, like uh, the other places besides Earth, that there's no guarantee that it would be based on the element carbon. If it was based on a different element in the periodic table, um, we might not even recognize it as life. It's, it's a pretty interesting discussion to have. So what are some of the patterns that you see in non-metals? Well, they're pore conductors. So this is the biggest thing that separates metals from non-metals, is its conductivity. So metals are generally very good conductors. Um, Nonmetals are generally very bad conductors. Also, the solid nonmetals, there aren't a whole lot of them. Most of them are gases. Um, but the solid nonmetals tend to be very dull in color, very, very brittle, which is, this will be the opposite of malleable. If you pound on a, on a nonmetal with, with a hammer, it's gonna shatter into a whole bunch of pieces and break in big chunks. It's not gonna like flatten out and let you shape it. Most of them are gases, so there are 16 of them, and 10 of them are gases, and one of them is a liquid. And we call that bromine. If you got bromine on your skin, it would burn you. Uh, so these things are, can be pretty nasty in their pure forms. Uh, so while metals get more and more metallic and more and more reactive as you go down and to the left, well, you would probably guess correctly that non-metals would be the opposite, and they get more and more reactive as you go up and to the right. And that would make, if you look in the very upper right-hand corner, except for the last row, because when we talk about this, this last column, I said row, geez, the last column of the periodic table um, is known as the noble gases. That's group 18, and they do not react with anything. So when we talk about getting more and more reactive as you go up and to the right, you don't count that final family. That final family doesn't react with anything. They just kind of watch all of the other elements in the universe react and have fights and join up and all that kind of stuff, and they just hang out on their own. And that would make fluorine then. Fluorine is the most reactive element in the universe. So it's the most reactive non-metal. Um, but if you were to compare the two, if you were to compare francium and fluorine, um, fluorine reacts with everything. There's even evidence that says that fluorine can force some of these noble gases, the ones on the far right that don't react with anything, um, that they can force them to react sometimes. All right, so here is a little chart that kind of, some of the things on here you're not gonna need to know, um, but for the most part, as you move down in this direction, they become more and more metallic as you move up in this direction, they become more and more non-metallic. And then remember, as you go down the periodic table, the, the, the atoms get bigger because every time you go down a row, you add a new shell to that electron cloud. So that means you add a new layer to the onion. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you go down. As you go across this way, the size doesn't really change because you're just filling in that shell. But when you go down another step, you add another shell to the outside. You're gonna learn what this stuff means when you get to the high school. It has to do with calculating rates at which chemicals will react with each other and 
so forth. All right, so here is our table again. So remember, here we have metals. And these are metals too. Um, but here we have metals. We have our non-metals. And that leaves this part here in the middle. And uh, if you look down here, it calls them semi-metals. They're also called metalloids. And as I said, it's really a continuum of properties. You have these things that are very metallic over here, and you have these things that are very non-metallic over here. So there has to be a tipping point along the way, and along the way you get things that are less and less metallic, right? Well, the line that we draw in the middle are the ones that you can't really put in one category or the other. So as I said, the biggest separator between metals and nonmetals is their ability to conduct electricity. So these ones can all conduct electricity. These ones, not so much, if at all. Um, you get a little bit, like you can get electricity being transported through like carbon and that kind of stuff. But um, these ones here are metalloids because sometimes they conduct electricity and sometimes they don't conduct electricity. And what's really interesting and useful about them is that you can control, we have the ability to control when they conduct electricity and when they don't conduct electricity. And we can do that by changing their temperature. Like you heat it up, suddenly it conducts electricity. Cool it down, it doesn't. Um, some of them are reactive to light. You shine light on them and, and now they conduct electricity and you put them in the dark and now they don't. Um, so there's different things that you can do to trigger this conductivity level. And that is what makes computers possible. If it wasn't for that ability to turn the movement of electricity off and on, computers wouldn't work. Um, so these are the elements that essentially make like the vast majority of our technology possible to even exist. So they are found in the boundary between metals and nonmetals. Um, they share characteristics of both. That's why they're on the boundary. Uh, you can change their ability to conduct electricity. This is what makes computer chips possible. And the most abundant one is silicon. Um, that's, that's the most common that we find on Earth. Uh, there's a lot of the element silicon out there, a lot of elements of um, atoms of, of silicon. I mean, If you just think of like sand, um, there's, there's silicon everywhere. But other ones that are pretty commonly used are things like germanium and arsenic. And I'm sure that you've heard of arsenic before. And if you think of arsenic, you probably think that doesn't sound very good because arsenic is poisonous. It has one of those properties that the nonmetals have where it's very, very toxic to living things. Silicon is not so toxic to living things. Living things don't mind having silicon around them at all. Some living things even make things out of, out of silicon. Um, but we said that these have to do with computers, so that's why you, they called that place out in California where all the companies, the computer companies called, they called it Silicon Valley. That's why. Um, but the reason that some of these are bad and the fact that they're toxic is bad is because if we're making all, the, all of our computer chips out of these elements, well, you have something called e-waste, right? So it's our, it's our electronic waste stream. And these are things that don't rot. It's not like food waste that can rot and turn back into their, you know, the elements and go back in the ground and get gobbled up by bacteria and give off methane. And we can capture that and turn it into energy. There's lots of stuff we can do with that stuff. The e-waste though becomes more of a problem because it's actually made of things that are toxic. So if you get places where they just throw away a whole bunch of computers and there are countries that for a long time we shipped all of this waste to like little tiny countries over around on the edges of, of Asia and places. Um, and then the main like economy of those places is to try to get some of these metals back out of the computer chips and recycle them. Um, but as a result, some of those places are the most toxic places on the planet. Um, like they, they're horrible for the people who actually live there. And there's one more category of elements. Uh, so you have your metals, you have your non-metals, you have your metalloids, and then you have your synthetic elements. Synthetic elements are the ones that don't exist in nature. We've never found them existing on their own. These are elements that we as humans have actually made. So it's possible that these elements don't exist anywhere else in the universe besides the ones that we've made. 
um, you know, you get lots of really interesting conditions that you have to create to, to make these elements actually form. So the highest naturally occurring element on Earth is element number 93, and that is uranium. So that's the biggest, heaviest, naturally occurring element. Everything above 93 on the periodic table, and that's a number you might want to put a little star next to. I think there's a question on the quiz about that. Um, everything above element number 93 is man-made. We have made it in industry, in labs. Um, the very first synthetic elements were plutonium, uh, which maybe you remember from movies like Back to the Future, uh, and americium. Now, we make these elements by taking a uranium element, an atom of uranium, which is the biggest one, that's number 93, and then we shoot a whole bunch of like neutrons at it and try to make it bigger and we, we have to like kind of try to shape that atom into something else. Now, if you think about it, what does this number mean? This number means that that's how many protons there are. So in order to actually make another element, higher element, element number 94, or element number 95, um, then we, that means we have to actually get another proton in there. It means we have to get a proton through the electron cloud, get it all the way down in there. And if you think about what happens with charges, this is kind of really important understanding how the structure of atoms work. Um, you can think of them like, like magnets where if you have two positive sides of a magnet, they don't want anything to do with each other. They repel, they don't attract each other. Where if you have opposite charges, then they attract. Well, the same is true for these parts of the atom. So to try to get a proton through the electron cloud of another atom, well, it's gonna be attracted to all those electrons. That's gonna cause it to not do what you want it to do. And then the closer it gets to the nucleus, it's gonna be repelled and repelled and repelled. It's gonna to wanna to be thrown back away before it even gets there. So you have to have enough speed and force to drive these things all the way in and actually make contact with the nucleus. And then something very special happens when you make protons touch. Um, it's the strongest force in the universe. It's called strong force, actually. Uh, and when you get protons close enough to each other, they stick. That is sort of the secret to things like nuclear energy and the atomic bomb and whatnot, because you have all of these protons that are stuck together and it takes an enormous amount of energy to hold them together because they want to fly away from each other. Well, that strong force is super strong. It is the strongest force in the universe, but it's, it can only function on a really tiny distance. And they essentially have to be touching or very close to touching in order for this force to actually kind of take control. So if you can spread those protons out a little bit and get them beyond the reach of the strong force, now all of that energy that it takes to hold them together gets just flies out because all of that like repulsion of charge sends those things flying. That's what happens in a nuclear explosion. You get these nuclei of, you know, like big uranium or big plutonium atoms that are so big that they can barely contain themselves. And then you shoot them with something that disrupts that and they all fly apart. And then it just releases an enormous amount of energy. Like it's like the surface of the sun. But anyway, um, to make these, you have to get a proton in there without causing that kind of chain reaction. Um, so we have made a couple of these. This is plutonium. This is a picture of plutonium in a um, nuclear power plant. And then this is actually lead, but in the inside in here is a americium. So it's, cl it's clamped in this ring of lead to try to keep the radiation under control because as these nuclei decay, you get these protons and neutrons that start flying out of the nucleus. That's what we call radiation. And it says that we use americium and smoke detectors. If you ever open up your smoke detector to change the battery, you'll see something that looks a little bit like this. And inside of that is this. And it works because this thing is shooting out radiation. It's shooting out particles that are, you know, smaller than atoms and if those particles run into something before they hit a detector on the other side which is why it's in this little thing so it shoots them in one direction that's why the lead is there it can only shoot it like straight out like a little ray um, and if something blocks that ray then it sets off the alarm 
because if there's something in the air that's going to block that ray, that's smoke. That's how a smoke detector works. So what do we do to get these protons going fast enough, the neutrons to going fast enough to try to get them into another atom to try to change that element into another element? Well, we use something called a particle accelerator. Now, particle accelerators would look like this on the inside, this huge long tube that we use to, to speed up and constantly speed up the, like the, the protons or the bits of things that we're trying to launch through there. So imagine this giant tube with this thing inside going, it's so small that, you know, it's subatomic, and we get it going super fast, nearly the speed of light. We try to get it as close to the speed of light as we can get it. And it goes around in these big loops. All right, this one looks like it goes in like a figure eight. Now, to put this into perspective, super colliders, the one that is planned, and I think building, um, down in Texas, is 51 miles long. So the circumference of the pipe is 51 miles. To put that into perspective in Pittsburgh, if we were to take that and drop it right on Pittsburgh, that's bigger than the blue belt. I realize you don't drive yet, but Pittsburgh has a bunch of a ring of roads that goes around it. There's the red belt and the orange belt, and the blue belt is the one that's all the way on the inside. But So it's the smallest of the belts. But it's about 40 miles long, it's 38 miles long. But the road goes through McKees Rocks all the way up 28, across the Highland Park Bridge, up through Squirrel Hill, and all the way back around into Dormont. That is smaller than this. That's how much length it needs to get these things going that fast. And then we just slam them into each other. So the first synthetic element that we used one of these particle accelerators to make is called curium. And we slammed a helium atom, so a an atom of helium, which has two protons and two neutrons and we slammed it into plutonium, which is already a synthetic element. So we were able to take plutonium, and you can look at your periodic table to see what element number plutonium is, and then we joined with it two more protons. So that means its periodic table number would have gone up by two. And that's how you get curium. So if you look at the periodic table, and that's, that's how that works. We added two protons, atomic number goes up two. And then as you look at a periodic table, you'll see a bunch of these like three letter symbols. If you ever see a three letter symbol on the periodic table, that means it just hasn't been given a name yet. Also keep in mind that some of these things, I'm not gonna say they're not like meant to exist because that doesn't really mean anything, but they don't exist very well. So some of these, when you get to the extreme ends and people get excited that there's like evidence that there's a new element, remember these things are getting slammed together and they're then bigger than what the laws of nature can hold together. So they fly back apart. So some of these elements exist for microseconds before they destroy themselves because they can't hold themselves together. So that's why I said it could be all the elements in the universe because we're reaching the limit where they, they literally don't stay together long enough to be useful at all. And that is the basics of the periodic table. We're going to start getting into next is the how to actually use the table as a tool and get meaning out of all of those patterns that we just discussed. Have a super fantastic day.